Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode 313. Uh, each week we meet here to answer the questions asked on the SEO Questions community on Google Plus and the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. With us tonight is Micah Fisher Kirshner. Micah is based on the west coast of the USA, not too far from Silicon Valley. Uh, Micah is uh, head of SEO for Turn River Capital. And Tim Kappa um, is based in Corby, 100 miles north of London uh, in the UK. Uh, Tim is a Google product uh, expert uh, in the Google My Business uh, community. He's also CEO of onlineownership.com. All right, our first um, question tonight uh, is um, um, it's titled um, Barely Any Content But Still Ranking Decently. Jason Hyangjil Kang said, uh, I have a competitor in my niche with less than 10 backlinks and barely any content on the website, but is still ranking decently for its top relevant keywords. Brackets, pages two and three. How is this possible? Well, depends on how competitive the keyword is. Um, sometimes it's just, I mean, well, it's also page two or three. So um, there are a couple of factors that play into this. Um, assuming that there isn't something, say, nefarious going on um, with just a little bit of backlink, some content, it might be sufficient for the query, depending on what uh, Google thinks is uh, relevant and worthwhile. Granted, it's still on page two or three, so kind of uh, less impactful. Uh, than it would be on page one. It's basically like if you want to hide something, bury it, you know, bury it in page below, you know, bury it after page one. So like, it, it's you know, it will be a little more interesting if it was actually ranking on page one. Then that would be something to kind of like go into and talk about. Um, yeah, like without kind of more information, what kind of keyword uh, and how competitive it is, it's sometimes a little difficult to say. Now, there's another possibility in that um, the domain itself is uh, pretty strong. So it may not be that the backlinks are giving the power directly, but through the internal links of the site. There's a lot of good links going in through, let's just say, the home page, and it's linked through the uh, home page to that specific page ranking. Then a lot of the value is funneling through the power of, of, of the internal links in the end. So that's also a possibility to consider. Um, not everything has to go direct for it to, to at least rank, especially for like page two or three. So that's kind of the way I would look at it. Thank you, Micah. All right, let's uh, record that as an answer. This one from Grace Kindred, uh, it's titled uh, Significant Visibility Drops. Grace said a lot of news publishers in the UK are suffering significant visibility drops. None seem to have made any significant technical changes. Could it be a possible algorithm update regarding fake news? Any thoughts or comments would be really appreciated. Thanks. If they're dropping because of fake news, then those are not news publishers. <laughs> I mean, plain and simple. Um, or they're they're just generally very very spammy websites. Uh, so let's see, when was the timing of this? December twenty first. Um, I don't know. Say they've rolled something out uniquely. Um, I haven't seen it. Wait, twenty first. Okay, timing. Um, in any case, uh, unless something just rolled out over the last day or two, which I haven't seen. Um, yeah, I haven't really noticed. Uh, again, this might be dependent on relevance. So there might be, you know, are they being replaced by other news publishers? Um, 
are they, or is it some other kind of site? So it might be just because of the holidays, shopping, things might be more along the lines of commercial intent currently rather than inf like informational intent. Um, yeah, so the, the, those are kind of things that might go there. Um, just kind of something that might pop off offhand, but I haven't, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen, noticed uh, or heard of any large updates during this, let's say, last week or so. Okay, thank you, Micah. And let's uh, wrap that one and uh, go to the next. This one from Emily Edgenfren, uh, titled um, a Presentation Dilemma on an e-commerce website. Emily said that we have a WooCommerce site. Our products are in several capacities like um, separator 100 kg and Oh, it's in different weights, 100 kilograms, 200 kilograms, 500 kilograms. And we add a product post for every different weight. Uh, now, what we, want, what we want to know is, is, is that good for SEO? Or should we just add one product post and uh, the capacity uh, is an option uh, on that the customer can select from a drop down uh, personally for the best would be unless you you're able to write unique product copy for your 100 200 and 500 gram product but i'm assuming it's the exact same product that they can order in different quantities of it um i would say one product that you can order in the different quantities if you can order in quantities, I don't know, let's just say this is coal, for example. Um, it, it's literally the same product, just different quantity uh, ordered. So I would just have the one page where you can put all your, you know, all your information about that product on that page, product description, what it's made of, any technical specs, whatever, and then an order quantity like 100 kilo, 200 kilo, 500 kilo. Uh, that is much better um, in terms of uh, SEO. Um, especially, you know, if you had a 100 kilo page, 200 kilo page, and a 500 kilo page, I don't know if you've already produced it, um, then uh, if you can't revert back, um, you know, I don't, you know, depends, then it, the, the, the thing to do would then be to um, canonicalize the other, let's call it inverted commas, duplicate products back to the originating uh, product itself. But in the ideal world, one product, select however many you want to buy of it or how many kilos or whatever. That's in, in the ideal world. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, my general philosophy is if there's no search volume um, <clears throat> for each of those kilogram weights, then it's not worthwhile to do, and you might as well just do one post. If there is volume for, for that, and by volume, people are actually looking for this, uh, then yes, do so, but they need to be unique. They can't just be like templated, plop out, put in 200, take out 200, put in 500. Okay. All right. Uh, let's um, move to the next. This one from Jay Lowe. Um, it's titled Google Search Console Coverage Report. Uh, Jay Lowe said, recently I found a, a, a GSC or a Google Search Console Coverage Report's valid pages numbers are uh, always lower than this, uh, the search for a, a site operator query. Um, do these two methods to check how many pages have been indexed work differently? Thank you, everyone. See, so Michael Martin has said, um, yes, they work differently. Uh, the index counts uh, shown in the search results maybe wildly inaccurate and you should treat them as unreliable and 
unless you can can confirm via other means. Yeah, it, it, it the ones that are in Google is a rough estimate is the way to look at it. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's inaccurate, but I would say it gives you a direction um, because if you qualify the search, it's going to dive in deeper. And so there, are, you know, I've I've had times where I'll do a generic search. Let's just say I get five million results. Then I do a more specific search, and then it'll give me ten million results, which doesn't really make sense um, to have a more granular search for a specific like section of the site to have and have even more results. And the reason is because it's doing it very quick, like eh, roughly here's here's a number. Oh, you want a little bit more accuracy? Okay, hold on, I'll dig a little bit further. Here's a here's a slightly more accurate number, so on and so forth. Um, so. The systems are different. One's in a tool, it's using its own data to crawl, whereas like another is just in aggregate kind of, they're essentially two different systems. And so it's not a, it's not really meant for you to compare the two together, but just to trend wise to kind of look at where it's going. Um, GSE would be more accurate in my opinion uh, at first glance. Um, but if, for whatever reason you're trying to find out information that looks better there, then like you can kind of use a public one just from a quick uh, trend standpoint just to get a general idea. It's not perfect whatsoever, but at least if you're trying to see where things are going in what direction, um, it's better than nothing at least. As long as the tool and data set used for that is being consistent, which I assume generally it is. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's um, go to the next. This one from Eric M. Hoover. Uh, it's titled The Average Click-Through Ratio of Knowledge Graph Results. Uh, and Eric said, that, does anyone know the average CTR of Knowledge Graph Results? He said, sorry, I, I know this is a vague question given the different types of info uh, presented in the Knowledge Panel, but I'm just looking for a ballpark for a client. Asking for a friend. Nope. Unfamiliar with any. Um, most of the most of the tools lately, Google doesn't really provide, unfortunately, any data on these days. The justification and helping of SEOs on data side is much, much more lackluster than it used to be. And I can't let this moment pass without calling out uh, uh, people like Michael Martinez, who uh, do a fabulous job um, through the week. They're relentless and uh, they answer questions almost as soon as they are asked uh, on our, particularly on our Facebook group. Um, we do have uh, um, a, a couple of people still answering questions uh, in our old, sorry, uh, um, Google Plus community. Um, but, um, yeah, our Facebook group is amazing. And we thank you. We, we are most grateful. All right. Uh, this one from Cassie Richardson. Uh, uh, it's on Google My Business. Multi-location service-based business uh, is the title. Um, and she goes on to say uh, businesses that do not have uh, physical locations. She said, I'm working with a client who owns a driving school. Um, there are 32 franchises in the same region of the state. Each franchise has its own service area, phone number and contact information. Um, the tricky thing is that they teach the classes either online or at local high schools. So the actual addresses are, are usually PO boxes and there aren't any physical offices. They're trying to straighten out their Google listings. They have 15 or so Google My Business pages already either claimed or unclaimed. Some have the incorrect street addresses, some have service areas, etc. I'm planning to manually create or clean up uh, each one, uh, marking them as serving the uh, city they are in. I'm wondering if there's an easier way to do this since there isn't a regular franchise or multi-location type of situation. Um, the same user will be the owner of each listing. 
Is there any way to speed up the process of claiming and optimizing? Okay, so, um, right. Um, I think I think this is the one in the, in the link. I actually gave you a link to the bulk uh, management tool. Um, now, uh, these franchise franchisees. Um, so, firstly, just so you know, you know, if they're serving customers at their location, you you know, and it's the franchise owner, um, then he could um, actually set it up at his home address. Um, but when it's set up, you select it as a service area business, it hides the address, and then you select your actual service area. Um, but I would use the bulk management account because you said there's, there's 15 or so. But, you know, if you've already started trying to create them, then they're already in the account, then, 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 then fine. Um, but it's probably easier in the bulk management. And then you once they're up and running, you can assign the franchisee as a manager of the listing so they can add posts they can add images of jobs that they've just recently done <coughs> things like that but um they would need to verify them at the you know if they work from their home they would need to verify uh use that home address um but because it's set as a service area business then um uh then it uh, it would hide that address and then you set your your thing uh just another quick thing i don't know what kind of franchise but if they're going out into the uh business itself google in the states uh is starting to run um local service ads um and even without running those as such there are a couple of verticals which they're already requiring or they're doing extra checks should we say so make sure if those are franchise owners and they are running the business from their home address that that business um, itself, the name of it, as well as their home address, is registered with the Secretary of State. Uh, it, that, it, Google may never check, but what I'm saying is that over, over uh, you know, over the last year, Google is trying to do a lot more of these in certain verticals. So, you know, and of course, if these are legit franchise owners in the States, they would have registered it anyway. But I'm just saying that's something to bear in mind. And even when they registered it, they wouldn't have registered at a PO box or at a, you know, at a, they register it at their home address because that's where they run the business from. So just something to bear in mind. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. All right, let's go to the next. Uh, this one from Jason Haiang Chul Chang again. Kang, sorry, Jason Haiang Chul Kang. Uh, he said, do I need Google My Business? Uh, he said that my uncle is, is a sole distributor in the US for an international product, actually it sanitizes for shoes, um, and he currently runs an e-commerce website selling uh, the, this product. He does have an office where he stores uh, all of his product and uh, um, works at a few hours a day. Um, and when I search the brand name, his office and address actually shows up on Google My Business uh, on the right. I'm just wondering if he needs a Google My Business because the physical location isn't actually a store and it's an e-commerce business. From what I know, an e-commerce website does not require a Google Business listing unless there are possibly other reasons why it may require one. In this case, uh, should he just keep his Google My Business listing or should I advise him to get rid of it? So, um, so actually, you know, e-commerce businesses uh, shouldn't have um, a GMB listing. Um, but it already exists, so you may as well, um, and obviously that's because where the business itself has run out of you should um if you're going to keep it then you should switch it to corporate office because you still can have one for um uh corporate offices 
because um, that's obviously where it's been run out of. So you can switch it to that um, and, you know, brand it. So create the brand, pop the branding on it, pop the images on it, um, you know, and, and properly brand it like anything else. I'm assuming he's got Facebook and I'm assuming, you know, properly brand it. It's an entity, own it. Um, simple as that. Uh, if there aren't any reviews on it, um, well, if you want, as I said in the chat, if you want to get rid of it, let me know and I can escalate and have it re removed. But, um, you know, you can technically have it for a, a corporate office, even though you operate online, like Uber. Uber's online, shouldn't actually have one, but they do have a corporate office, therefore they can have one. So, you know, it, it can technically be, be like that. But if you ran an e-commerce shop from home, nah, nah, that, that doesn't work. Okay, thank you, Tim. All right, let's uh, go to the next. This one from Ian McLeod on should I delete pages with a high bounce rate? Ian said that we have some content on our website that has been there for many years. The, the content is essentially pages of free business letters that serve to attract traffic to our site. I don't think you would call them door, doorway pages because it is the content that the user is searching for. Analytics say, analytics show 92% of visitors to these free letters are first time visitors. Um, but the um, theory is that they may take note and return it another time for paid products. 89% exit from the entry page, and these pages do not contribute any revenue in sales. And we do not serve advertising on these pages. You might consider some of the content thin by today's standards, but it is useful to the visitor. And we figure they must be copying the content or reading it or, or something because they stay on the page uh, for an average of three minutes, 33 seconds. However, these pages have a high bounce rate, average 85%, and we won't worry that the high bounce rate associated with these pages is sending poor quality singles, signals to Google and wonder if we should delete them or simply leave them as no index. What does the panel say? Yeah, so just having a high bounce rate doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Um, as you're kind of leading yourself towards with this already. Uh, if they're spending a lot of time on a page, then that's great. That implies the intent has been um, served, or the user, the user's intent has been served. Um, and even if the bounce rate is, uh, even if the time on site was low, depending on the type of page, um, that could still play that part. Of it. So one of the things you can check is if these pages are long, and it's kind of what you're implying is, um, uh, you can see how people are interacting on the page by adjusting your analytics. You can do on scroll events. Um, you can uh, run it on like on events of how much time they're spending on the page and where they're at. Um, you can even run user surveys, uh, heat maps, click maps, etc., to see kind of what's going on with your users for the page to get a better sense of how people are on average going through that. Um, and then probably one of the, the lazier, I'd call it, versions of it that could be interesting would be converting some of the, some of the pages just out of curiosity um, to see what would happen into um, you know, creating some kind of call to action as it goes through. Um, getting people to sign up to, for a newsletter, uh, to fill out a form to get more information, turn it into a PDF, et cetera, just to see if that you know, does create uh, more interaction within the site. There are ways to just see um, how flexible these, these users are and see if that also helps drive down the bounce rate a bit, just to make sure. But in the end, I wouldn't really worry about a uh, high bounce rate if you feel that the visitors to the to these pages are being well served. Excellent. And the, again, I'll point out uh, Michael Martinez, who also answered on this one. All right, let's um, move on to the next. This one from Mohammed Yasir Ayub. Um, Mohammed uh, has a question titled, Google automatically removed my ranking. Mohammed said, hello, 
please help me uh, in a Google My Business ranking. My Google My Business listing is based in Karachi, uh, Pakistan. And when I started, there were already two Google My Business listings showing on Google My Business. So I created my own original listing and there was, um, and it was, it was able to rank on some keywords, but when I removed the two uh, Google My Business listings because of duplication, um, then Google automatically removed my ranking and also uh, my info pack on searching my business name. Please guide me. Thanks. <coughs> okay, so there's a misconception that, oh, right, so they removed this and there was an impact on ranking. It doesn't kind of work like that uh, with GMB. GMB works on, you know, um, location, proximity, uh, uh, and basically the, you know, uh, greater online, um, uh, the greater online awareness of that, of that business itself. Um, so, you know, duplicates by removing duplicates, it should have actually helped you. It doesn't actually impact you. Um, when you said keywords, that makes me nervous because it sounds like you were keyword spamming your name. Um, so I would seriously go back to to the, the, the basics. The name of your business and your GMB page and the name of your business, uh, you know, your website, they match. Um, you know, you've got your address. For of the business, the, the, the location on your website. Um, your structured data markup matches the, 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 the address on your website as well as your GMB page. Um, uh, you provide some, you know, if depending, if it's not so easy, you know, you're on a, a second street of the main street behind whatever, make sure that you provide some decent directions for your customers. Um, and make sure that you have some, uh, you know, local uh, business citations out there, which replicates the same name, the same address, the same phone numbers, uh, and, and 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 the and the description of of the um, the business. GMB machine learns, so it's not necessarily just a category, but GMB GMB is like Google. A machine learns based upon what's on your business page, the description and, you know, actual physical, you know, um, your Google posts, as well as what's on your website. And then it machine learns, tries to understand better and narrow down what you actually provide. Um, so, yeah, I think you've kind of got a little bit of a misconception there. Do removing duplicates would have been good. Uh, it doesn't like remove rankings or something. Um, but I would just go back to the basics. Your name, your address, make sure your phone number, your website, make sure it's uh, it's all the same across all properties. Make sure that your structured data markup on your website reflects exactly the same. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a little bit more difficult to find, you know, provide some actual directions uh, on your site. That normally helps Google to understand where you are, um, especially in some of these countries where it's not, exactly specific or, or, or easy to find um i would certainly uh, i would certainly you know look at things like that um but rankings typically are and the biggest one is location based <coughs> so if you say you're in karachi and you know there's 57 other businesses between you and where uh, someone else searches on the other side of karachi that that is something that you can't you know, uh, you can't like do anything about it because it's literally based on when somebody searches on their mobile, I want um, shoe repair. And there are 57 businesses between that guy's phone and his location and your business on the other side. That, that unfortunately is, it's, it's, that is just something that's completely out of your control. Um, but organically, that doesn't stop you uh, because, you know, organic organically doesn't, you know, work that way. Um, yeah. So, so, so go back to basics and, and, and look at, and look at the basics. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Let's go to the next.
Review biz ye shoppy. Um, <laughs> nice name. Um, the question is titled one year old blog, but still no traffic. Review biz said, hello, friends. I have a one year old blog named review biz uh, and no web traffic. Please provide tips on how to get web traffic. Thanks. Uh, yeah, provide stuff that people want to read. My top tip, and I have to go. Um, sorry, chaps. <laughs> Cheers. No worries, Tim. Thank you for your help this week. All right, um, Micah, we will struggle through these, the, you and I. All right. Um, um, look, I, I think we'll pass on review biz. Um, that was a succinct answer from Tim. Um, let's go to the next. This one from Justin Mager. He said the organic traffic is better than AdWords traffic. Well, it's titled that. Um, I'm not sure of the accuracy of the statement. Anyway, a few questions. Uh, he said, uh, we recently migrated a website to a new e-commerce platform. The old website was on Network Solutions. Long story short, the website has been active for just over a month, and I have noticed a 115% a gain in organic traffic, while my Google AdWords traffic has decreased ab about 80%. Granted, this was coming off a website uh, with uh, almost uh, no uh, SEO. Sales are seeing a slight increase as well as um, better search engine result page rankings. Any insight into how I can better understand if the website is tracking correctly? No sense in paying for ads if they are not driving sales. So first off in theory, congrats. Um, secondly, what I would say is you're going to need to do uh, have someone who actually can understand uh, AdWords analytics and tracking. So a quick little audit probably would be useful. Um, for example, what could be happening um, is that a number of your AdWords uh, links are breaking on their tracking when it goes to your site and then be being attributed as organic. Things like that can happen if you're accidentally redirecting your UTM parameters or uh, if you didn't put them all in correctly. Um, so you're going to want to basically check for those types of situations to make sure that attribution is properly being put together. Um, even, yeah, so that's... I, think, I mean, those are usually, that, that's like pretty much usually the big ones. There's other possibilities of, of um, just like URLs. You're sending to the old URLs, um, so they're no longer traffic is being sent to the proper places anymore. It could be a temporary dip because you have a, a whole change of a website maybe um, that might have impacted. And so your quality score is going to, not quality score, but the, the yeah, it's hold, it's, pulling back from your positions versus where they were before. So there's there's a couple of possibilities that require a bit of auditing to double check everything that uh, you or someone that needs to help dive into to see what's going on. Um, yeah. Thank you, um, Micah. And uh, also I'd like to point out uh, people like Perry Bernard and Dave Elliott uh, stalwarts uh, on our uh, Facebook group who um, provide answers, immediate answers, uh, throughout the week. All right, let's um, move on to the next. Ah, one from Micah fisher Kirshner. Um, what to check after changing a website theme. Um, Micah wrote uh, a... Uh, Website is undergoing undergoing a reskin slash theme change, not a re redesign with URL changes. Uh, for your information, uh, what's unique? Something that's uniquely overlooked for SEO. I'll have to call on you, Micah. I can't see anyone else around here. I can't answer my own question. 
I would break the reality of everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I just was asking from a standpoint just to get, yeah, you know, think about things that I might miss. Um, kind of always like to jump in with a few questions here, there, and, and kind of think about uh, things outside the box. So the results, uh, the, not the results, the answers from a lot of people are pretty good. So I thank them for their time and effort into putting questions or answers to my question. Good on you, Micah. Yeah. Um, we were talking before uh, um, we started recording uh, tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, what's um, impressing me is the, not, not the quantity, but the, the quality of the responses that we're getting. Um, the, 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 it's, it's, it's a heartwarming thing to uh, look at our uh, little group and see how it's uh, growing. All right, let's um, move on with the next. Vincent Chan, uh, he's found some changes in the Google Search Console. Uh, he said a lot of pages have been excluded. The important change is discovered, not currently indexed, a page has been rising. Crawled, not currently uh, indexed pages are down a little. Um, what is the reason? Um, well, I mean, the tool's changing, so I don't know if as a whole, uh, that's new. But generally, if it, what can be happening is previously you had a lot of pages that were being crawled, and then now they're only, um, or sorry, previously a lot being discovered before being crawled and vice versa. So it's just, they're, they're different settings. It just means, hey, we've discovered a ton of new pages. Um, and we've yet to crawl them. Um, so it, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process. And where that comes from and where those pages are being discovered or crawled uh, will dramatically vary depending on kind of your structure of your site. So um, hard to say kind of why, but uh, you know, it's places where that can occur is your external site map, your website architecture, your URL that you've submitted. Um, those are potential layers for how that affects both discovery as well as crawlability. Thank you, Micah. All right, let's um, move on to the next. This one for me and McLeod, another one for me and McLeod. Uh, he said, uh, Do, can certain keywords hurt other keywords? He said, we have some content on our website that has been there for many years. Um, the content is essentially pages of free business letters that serve to attract traffic to our site. The question is, uh, are these um, free legal letters affecting the higher quality pages that we wish to be ranked for? Is it uh, muddying the waters uh, for the topics uh, overall? Does the appearance of the word free in a site structure, file names and keywords hurt us? I mean, I don't think of it as keywords unless they're like kind of in the spam side of things or in like um, uh, kind of areas of which Google doesn't like uh, or is, you know, it's going to get you hidden from the results like porn or something. Um, I, I would be more concerned with the potential of if you've got pages that are too close to each other and you're getting the wrong page to rank. Um, or uh, That and Google confused about which page and is choosing the one of which you don't prefer. Um, but just having kind of, say, separate pages, one that's free, one that's not, doesn't necessarily mean that's uh, going to be bad for you. Um, it, it's just, it, you know, it, it, it's, kind of a view of how close it is and how strongly do the pages match to the user intent based on the search results you're currently seeing on Google as the best way to kind of judge whether or not 
those pages or maybe keywords could be affecting um, how you rank. And without kind of a deeper insight, it's a little hard for me to give more specific uh, thoughts on that. Okay. Th th thank you, Monica. All right. Um, uh, I think this is our penultimate question. Or, no, no, well, I'm not sure. Zawa Kamal. It's titled A Checklist to Make Sure Everything is Okay. Zawa said, Hi there. I just updated my WordPress website to version 5.0, uh, built on the Avada theme which supports WordPress 5.0. What should I do now? Um, any, is there a checklist that I can perform on my website to make sure everything is okay? Do I need to update uh, all of my pages with the Gutenberg uh, editor? I'm not sure where to start, and it would be great if anyone can help. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the Avada theme, Gutenberg editor, et cetera. Um, from a general checklist, uh, I, 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 you know, you want to just make sure that your page, just like look at your type of page template. So, um, you know, your your blog posting, your blog page theme, your blog homepage. Um, and I'm assuming from a WordPress that everything's kind of a blog. It can be you know, your, your main site, but basically look by page template and see if there are anything broken on just one or two examples of those page templates to give an idea of has anything broken when you move to an upgraded uh, version of WordPress slash theme. Um, and the areas in which you should check are the general kind of standard SEO things, did the title tags change, header change, URL change, links change, um, speed of the page, the types of stuff that might be impactful. Um, things that you would normally do when it comes to auditing uh, here on the SEO side or making optimizations to it. You just want to double check that nothing has dramatically changed in any way. Excellent. Thank you, Micah. Hmm? Thank you. Uh, let's go and check it. If, yes, it is that time. Thank you for watching time. Um, we appreciate uh, the interest that you show in watching our clips. Uh, um, you make what we do uh, worthwhile, and, and for that, we're, we're, we're truly uh, grateful. Um, we'll be back at the same time next week uh, to do this uh, all again. But uh, for now, it's good night.